Welcome to Continuous Performance Benchmarking for Vitesse Maintainer Talk. My name is Alkin and I'll be your host today. And uh, today's agenda, I'll be doing an introduction to Vitesse and uh, Manan will do a benchmarking as a product information and Florent will give you benchmarking on internals uh, from the Vitesse project. A little bit about Vitesse is a Vitesse database clustering system for the horizontal scaling of MySQL. It is a known CNCF graduate project and open source uh, licensed, and we have contributors around the world. Uh, more on Vitesse is uh, Vitesse is a single illusion of a database, actually dedicated connection that can work on MySQL 5.7 or 8.0, and it is compatible with the frameworks like and, and ORMs, uh, common frameworks and ORMs, and um, it is known to be scalable. Also provides high availability and durability guarantees of the database. Uh, very highly adopted and serves millions of QPS around the world. You might be using day to day and um, mostly a very large implementations are, are, are there to be known. Also other implementations are in the market right now. So let's go into the concepts of, of Vitesse. Um, Vitesse, because it's a sharded system, has a, has a key space concept for a logical database and provides a shard as a logical database and uh, comes with a, with a, a concept called cell for a failure domain. Vitesse uh, architecture actually serves with a primary and replicas. It uses the MySQL pr uh, primary and replica concept and uh, mainly um, comes with a VT tablet. And a VT tablet is a, is a, is a sidecar to a MySQL D process. It usually uh, sits next to the MySQL D and, uh, and drives the Vitesse process against the MySQL. Here's an example of uh, multiple clusters, and you can have um, be running under Vitesse for the large uh, implementations. So we need a concept like a VT gate. VT gate is a stateless proxy, speaks the MySQL protocol, and impersonates monolithic MySQL server. This allows um, applications to speak to VT tablets from the Vitesse standpoint. If you have a, even a larger deployment, you will actually deploy multiple VT gates to access the, these clusters. And in this way, you will have an access um, that is also scalable from the proxy standpoint and the connection standpoint. Uh, application, uh, how does the application access the sharded system? So in this example, you will see a VT gate routes the traffic to the sharded clusters. In our example, we have two shards in, in commerce database and one internal shard on an uncharted space. And this way you can actually have an access to the charted environment with the access from the application. So in our example over here, we have a, a commerce database and, uh, and then we want to search by um, the orders in customer ID and then application sends the query as always it does to a regular uh, database connection to in this case the MySQL but the VT gate understands and knows where where the, the customer ID uh, parts will fall in and it will route the traffic to those and this way you can actually scale indefinitely on the also, another component uh, from the Vitesse architecture, important component in, in the Vitesse architecture is the topo. Topo is a, is a, is a state uh, of where the, the MySQL and, and database components are, as well as the Vitesse components sits. So um, there are multiple implementations of topo that you can choose. Um, favorite ones are etcd, zookeeper, and kubernetes. And, uh, and the known uh, console is also a topo manager that was used in the past. Uh, VTCDLD is another uh, component of, of Vitesse. It's a control daemon and it, it runs the ad hoc operations that serves as an API server and then uh, interacts with the, with the topo. So they all come together in this architecture summary. So you have an application server that connects to the load balancer. Load balancer actually speaks to VT gauge, which interacts with VTCTLD and topo server and, uh, and, in, and serves the incoming queries from the sharded clusters behind the scenes. We test also have very new and upcoming features. Um, as of today, we have a 12.0 release in, in GA, and uh, we support online DDL operations uh, without locking. And um, we test comes with an experimental version of the Gen 4 planner, which is a very new and um, highly improved. And we do continuous benchmarking, which is the subject of, of the talk today. And we have ongoing performance improvements and uh, also tools like VT admin and uh, are coming up in the next releases. So um, we will continue with the next section and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Algar. I am Manan Gupta and I will be taking you through the next part of our presentation. I am going to introduce RE Fast Year, which is the nightly benchmarking tool for Vitess. And then eventually I'm going to show you the website of RE Fast Year, which I have linked over here as well, and the results that it has produced. I've also linked the code over here. Please go through it uh, uh, um, after, the, after the presentation. So let's dive in. 
First things first, what is benchmarking? Benchmarking is a way to measure and compare the performance of one software version against another. So when we're building Vitesse, we have the main branch, we have different releases of Vitesse, release 12, release 11. We have different patch releases, we have PRs, which are changing some part of the code base, and we want to measure the performance of each of these and compare that which one is better. So this is what enables us as developers to know that if a code change that we've done, is it improving the performance of some part of the code or not? This is the benchmark. This is the benchmarking tool that we have, are we fast yet? Which is what we use for building high performance for tests. Largely benchmarks can be broken into two parts, micro benchmarks and micro benchmarks. Let's go over both of these. So micro benchmarks, like the name suggests, micro benchmarks, they measure a small part of the code base. Usually this is done by isolating a single function call and doing it repeatedly. What we mean is, let's say that we have a benchmark and uh, we run it for two seconds. Within those two seconds, we keep calling the same function again and again with the same parameter values. And the number of times that the function is able to run within those two seconds is how fast the function is able to run. Now we have a wide array of micro benchmarks in Vitesse, which test the planner, the parser, RPC calls, and these are the things that are on the top of my head, among others. So we have a very extensive code coverage in micro benchmarks. If you want to take a look, you can go over the Vitesse code base and within the testing files of Go, local unit testing files of Go, you'll find benchmark tests, which is what our micro benchmarks are. The micro benchmarks measure the performance of a code base as a whole. So when a user when a user uses Vitesse, they're not going to be able to see what the what, what is the amount of time that the parser took, or what was the amount of time that the query was planned for, or uh, what was the execution time. What they generally see is just the latency of the uh, of the result set that they get back when they query the database. And this is what we measure via our macro benchmarks. So they measure the performance of the entirety of the of the entire code base, and they run in an environment which is very similar to what the end users experience. We're not going to go over how we bring up that environment or how this is all done, because that is something that Florent will cover in the next part of the code base when he deep dives into how Ari Fastit is built and uh, the way that we bring up our infrastructure and how run the uh, macro and micro benchmarks. The, ma the macro benchmarks that we run, we have two categories for them, OLTP and TPCC. Again, we won't go into much detail. Florent will cover that later. Now, the next question that arises is what all do we benchmark? We have several cron jobs which are configured to run daily, and these cron jobs keep tab of the main branch, the release branches, the tags, and the PRs which have the benchmark me label. So every day, if there is any any PR which has been merged into the main branch of a test, we check that the uh, commit hash has changed for the main branch, and we run the benchmarks for it, both micro and macro benchmarks. Same is what we do for release branches, different tags, and we also do that for all the PRs which have the benchmark me label. So even before you able you merge your PR, you already know the performance impact that it is going to have both on the, on the unit that you're trying to change and also on the whole, whole code base of a test. This is what makes the user experience, the developer experience, a lot better. Taking that a step further, we also have Slack integration. So are we fast yet? Once it has run the micro benchmarks and the macro benchmarks and stored those results, we use those results and compare them against each other. For example, we'll take the main branch and we compare it against the results of the previous day run of the main branch. Same, we'll do it for the main branch against the release and we'll do it for PRs also against the base of the head of the PR. Once we have these comparisons, if there is any regression, then we send a Slack notification on the pod benchmarking testing channel. And then the uh, developers can look at this, they can check out what the regression was, in which benchmark the regression came, and they can then figure out what was the change that made the uh, regression, or that caused the regression. I'm going to diverge here a little bit and talk about the Gen4 planner. So what is the Gen4 planner? Gen4 is a new VTGate planner, which is meant to succeed V3. So this is something that we've been working on with test lately, and currently it is an experimental feature, but eventually we're going to make it the default. And Gen4 is a much more advanced planner than V3. It provides a larger query support. A bunch of correlated subqueries will start working with Gen4. There are newer primitives, semi-join has been introduced, and uh, work for supporting filtering on the VTGate level is also ongoing. So eventually, Gen4 is going to become much more powerful than what V3 is. Not only that, it also creates optimized plans, which are much faster while execution. But how can we say for certainty that the optimized plans are faster or the plans that Gen4 produces are actually better? How do we gain confidence that Gen4 is indeed a much is a success of a V3 and we can replace uh, the default on the uh, Vitesse website? The way that we do that is via the benchmarks. So we run the benchmarks, the macro benchmarks for both V3 and Gen4, and then we compare the results. We look at the queries that they have served per second, the amount of user memory uses that they have on VT tablet, the amount of CPU uses that they have on VT gates, and all these metrics, and then we take a look at does Gen4 actually improve the latency that the user is going to see. Enough talk. We've talked about what benchmarks are, the different type of benchmarks, how Gen4 and Gen4 is, and how we're supposed to use my benchmarks for Gen4. I think it's time that we look at the website. Are we fast yet? And we actually talk about what the users are going to gain from it. We've already divulged into what the developers gain from it, how PRs run against that, and 
it, it improves the developer experience. It's time to take a look at what the user end users can gain from RV Fast yet. So this is the main homepage for RV Fast yet. And here we have a brief overview of what RV Fast yet, kind of what like I gave you. And here we're also looking at the uh, server that we're using actually to run the macro benchmarks. It's an Equinix M2 X large X86 server. And for the most, more enthusiasts of you guys, you can actually take a look at the server specifications and uh, see what, what uh, hardware we're actually using to run our macro benchmarks and micro benchmarks. More on this later. The next page that I'm going to show you is the cron page of, of this page. So we talked about crons a little while ago, wherein we track the main branch and we run uh, the macro and micro benchmarks for it every day if the git hash changes. And those results for the previous month are actually shown here for the past 30 days. So this tracks the OLTP runs, the transactions per second, the QPS, the latency, all of this are shown over here over the past month. And the same we do for TPCC as well. So the next page that I'm going to show you is the search page. Over here, you can actually give a very specific GitHub hash that you're looking for. So you can take a GitHub hash from GitHub and look for the uh, uh, for, for results for that specific hash. Uh, if you have those results for it, then we're going to display them over here. And you can look at the macro benchmark results, OLTP runs. We also track the total CPU time uh, individually for what the CPU time for VT gate was, VT tablet was, the amount of Allocate uh, bytes it was it allocated on VTGate, the amount of bytes it allocated on VT tablet. All of this information is available over here for both micro and macro macro benchmarks of TPCC OLTP. And we also have a bunch of micro benchmarks over here which show their runs, the number of iterations, all the information that you need. Now I can even go over in one of these uh, micro benchmarks and it will show the runs of the past five days of past few iterations of that uh, micro benchmark. So these are the past iterations of the past 10, uh, 10 or so runs for this micro benchmark that we're looking at. It will also have the start time and uh, exactly at what time these were benchmarked, the GitHub references for them. So you can take a look at this as well. Now this page was specifically catering to one GitHub hash. What if you wanted to compare two GitHub hashes together? And that's what this page does. So the compare page of, uh, of this website, you can actually go over and give two GitHub hashes and you will have their comparisons for macro and micro benchmarks along with some nice graphs which will show you graphically of what the differences are. So this is actually a much older commit and AA79 is actually a later commit. So this later commit, uh, you'll see that actually there has been some performance improvement. We'll talk about that a little later as well. Uh, the amount of CPU time that we were using actually decreased. And so th this is where you can see the comparison between two, uh, two commit hashes along with, this is the comparison between the uh, micro benchmarks as well. So like all the information that you would need for comparing two, uh, two hashes is over here. All of this is all great and, and such, but there's actually something which is even more useful. So on the micro benchmark page, a dedicated micro benchmark page, here you can compare the results for different tags of Vitesse. For example, like you're a company who's upgrading from who on version 10 of Vitesse or release 10 of Vitesse, and you're actually looking to upgrade to release 11. And you want to look at what all differences or what all performance improve you can expect when you go from release 10 to release 11. So over here in drop down boxes, you can just select the version that you're on and select the version that you want to get to or what you want to compare it against and just go. Over here, I'm currently showing results for the comparison between 10 and version 11. And here you'll see the micro, macro benchmark or micro benchmark results for all of them. So this interface is actually very similar that we have for the macro benchmarks as well, where you have the results for two tags that you can compare. You don't specifically need to search for the GitHub hash and use those. You can directly search, uh, compare different tags. Here I'm comparing uh, release 10 versus release 11. And if you look here, there is actually a 5% increase between between the QPS that release 11 was able to serve against release 10 for the OLTP workload. It is because of this macro benchmarking tool that we have that we can say with confidence that actually if, if the users who have a workload which is very similar to OLTP, if they move from release 10 to release 11 of a test, they can expect a performance improve of 5.3%. Similarly, if someone has a workload which is closer to TPCC, they can actually expect the improvement of 3.4%. So the confidence that we say that there has actually been a performance improvement from release 10 to release 11 comes from these numbers that we're seeing over here. Finally, we've created one special tab, the one that I talked about, that Gen4 is a new planner. We also need to benchmark what that new planner is doing. So we have a specific page for it, which is called V3 versus Gen4. And this page shows the results of the comparisons between V3 and Gen4. Here as well, you can select which tag you want to check the comparison for. You want to check it on main or on some other uh, release. Um, or for example, let's say that you are on release 12 and you want to look at what the uh, what was the comparison between V3 and Gen4 for release 12. You can take a look at that as well. 
So here you can see that Gen 4 is slightly better than uh, V3, but most of its capability as of now in Gen 4 is actually coming from the fact that it can support a lot more queries than V3. So here you can compare the results. If you go over to, uh, if you click here to see, actually see the query plans, this is kind of a beta feature. It's not entirely developed kind of in production, uh, uh, work in development, but over here, we actually have all the queries. You can look at the queries that we're running in the OLTP workload. These are generally point queries, and you can look at the plan that VT gate and we, uh, that, that V3 and Gen4 fallback built for it. So this is the query that you got, select C. It's a normalized query, so all input arguments have been converted to bind variables. And then you can actually look at what uh, VT gate is going to do with it. It's going to actually send it to a single shard because it's a select equal unique query. And this is also a place where you can look at the plans that they're going to, uh, the, uh, that VT uh, gate is going to create. So you can have different plans for uh, Gen 4 and V3 as well, which is where the optimizations will come into play. This is the TPCC page for the same thing. Um, so you can look at this and you'll see that the plans are different for V3 and Gen 4. Um, yep. This is pretty much all that is there on the website, but this allows the users to actually know beforehand even before they start testing their own local environment, what differences they can expect or what performance improvement they can expect, whether the mini tablet will actually start using more CPU time, will it start allocating more bytes? Is, is the Gen 4 planner actually worth it? Will it give you more, uh, will it give you better performance? All of that can be answered and with high confidence because of the benchmark tool that we have in RB Fast yet. Before I pass the baton on to Florent, there's just one more thing I would like to add. Gen 4 right now is in active development and we're looking for ways to improve its performance. So if any of you guys are, are running with tests in production, we, we would love if you would be able to share your production queries with us and we, we then optimize Gen4 to actually work as, pe as best as possible, like produce as optimal plans as possible for your specific workload. Um, if any of you guys will, are willing to take us up on our offer, please find us in the Vitesse Slack. This is all from my side and Florent will now take over and talk about the benchmarking and how we built it up, built it from the uh, ground up. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Florent and today I'll be talking to you about the internals of a benchmarking system. So let's get started first with the implementation that we use for Fast yet. Um, so we have two permanent server. The first one is the website. Its goal is to serve the web UI that Manan showed you earlier. And its secondary goal is to handle and manage the whole execution of benchmark. When I say the whole execution of benchmark, I mean the, the cron schedules, and, um, and that's it, just a current schedule. Um, secondly, we have the metrics server. Uh, this one is scrapping the benchmark results and storing the data. Um, another key point of our implementation is the fact that we spawn a new server for each benchmark that we have. Um, this allows us to have more reliable results and um, make sure that the benchmark is not influenced by anything else uh, when it runs. Um, each new server is based on the Equinix Metal service. Um, CNCF has a partnership with Equinix Metal for projects like Vitesse. Um, and final key point of our implementation, we store all the benchmark results and the metadata in uh, MySQL. In fact, it's not directly MySQL, but we store it in a Vitesse cluster. Um, let's talk about the execution pipeline. It's a very important part of, um, of the implementation and our fast yet. Uh, the goal of it is to manage the whole execution workflow from start to finish. Um, so we'll, we'll get to what the whole execution workflow means in, in a bit. Um, the pipeline is configurable through a YAML file, uh, meaning that uh, we can have tons of different execution we want to have. So for example, micro benchmark and macro benchmark, like Manon just explained before. And those two different types of benchmark will have different YAML files. So the whole execution workflow, what is it? Uh, what, what are the responsibilities? First, uh, the creation and configuration of a new server. This is the very basic step. Um, we want to make sure that we create a server, we configure it based on a very detailed and explicit uh, configuration. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, another point is, another responsibility is the setup of a Vitesse cluster. Uh, depending on the type of benchmark, we, we might or might not want to have um, a VTS cluster. So this is uh, part of the execution pipeline responsibilities. Um, another one is the actual execution of a benchmark. When I say actual execution of a benchmark, I mean running the benchmark. Uh, then we need to store the results and the metrics. And finally, we need to upload and publish those results. Um, and, and there's kind of like a, 
intermediate steps between those two responsibilities, which is aggregating the results, um, compiling them, and checking if there is any regression or not. This is a whole part, um, like everything is part of the execution pipeline. Um, this is the architecture of our execution pipeline. Uh, we have seven steps. I'm going to go through them quickly. Uh, so the first one, like I said, it's the configuration file. We feed the execution pipeline with a configuration and then everything gets created like magic. Um, so we feed the configuration and then second step is the provision. We create uh, the execution server using Terraform. So this is just to provision and, and configure the very basic steps, uh, very basic things about the server. And this is um, provisioning on Equinix Metal, like I just said. Third step is the configuration of the server. When I say configuration, I mean the installation of packets, installation of of tools that we need, um, setting up the network, setting up the, the disk, anything. Um, this is done using Ansible. So for those that don't know Ansible, it's basically a configuration tooling that, that allows us to automate and um, easily do a bunch of configuration things on, on servers. Uh, fourth step is the the start of a benchmark. Um, so we actually want to start the benchmark, start recording the results. Then we have a benchmark running, which is the red square here, the red rectangle. Um, so the benchmark can be either a macro benchmark or a micro benchmark. Fifth step is actually storing the results. So this can be done either at the end of the benchmark or during the benchmark, like throughout the whole execution process of the benchmark. Um, we store the results in different locations. Um, most basic one is MySQL. This is going to be like very basic information. For example, the type, the type of benchmark, um, I don't know, the ID of the benchmark, everything like that, like the SHA, for example, the Git SHA. Then we store information also on Prometheus. Um, that, the information that we store on Prometheus is obviously time series data. Um, and this is all the metrics, for example, the CPU usage that we, that we had for a specific benchmark at a specific time. Um, we store the metrics uh, that we have in InfluxDB in, uh, in Prometheus, sorry. We, the data that we have there, we store it in an InfluxDB server later on. This is done to keep data a bit longer, um, keep as little as possible inside Prometheus, then store for longer term inside InfluxDB. And, um, and that's it. Sixth step is uh, actually destroying, tearing down the, um, the execution server. So again, this is done using Terraform. Um, seventh step is the publishing, like it's actually publishing the results. So um, like I said before, right before publishing the results, we have to compile them, aggregating them, uh, making sure there's a regression or not. We have to calculate this. And depending on all those outcomes, we might or might not want to notify people on Slack. Um, the web UI will show up differently different, based on those outputs, etc. So this is the, the architecture. Um, I'm going to move on to how we do a micro benchmarks, a micro benchmark. Um, so this is out of the two types of benchmark that we have, this is the simplest one. Uh, why? Because Vitesse is coded in Golang. Um, and Go has an amazing testing framework, which include a, a micro benchmark tool. So, you know, when you write code in Go, you can, in specific when you, when you write test in Go, you can either have like an actual unit test or you can have a benchmark test. And we have a bunch of those inside um, inside the code of Vitesse. And the goal is just, the goal of a micro benchmark is just, is just to execute all of those benchmark tests. Uh, we get an output every time that we execute one. Uh, we parse the output, we keep the relevant information, and then we aggregate all the information from all the different um, micro benchmark, and, uh, and finally we store them. Um, so like Manan mentioned earlier, we have a multitude of relevant or important information inside a micro benchmark, for example, the time it takes for a function to get, to get executed, um, the memory usage of a function, and, and so on. So. Um, this is all part of the micro benchmark. I'll get back to them um, during the demo. Um, but yeah. Macro benchmarks, a uh, second type of benchmarks. Um, that type has a longer execution time. Why? Because it's, well, for, first of all, we have to install a lot more packages. For example, MySQL, etcd, um, etc. We have to install more stuff. We have to set up more stuff. Um, 
for example, the Vitesse cluster needs to be created. Uh, it has to be up and running. Um, so yeah, longer execution time, that's it. And then uh, second point, we use Sysbench to actually do the benchmark of the Vitesse cluster. So Sysbench is a widely known tool, um, which I'll, I'll get back to it uh, in, in a coming slide. Um, another important part of a macro benchmark is actually distinguishing the different types of benchmark. That means that we're going to get a lot of different results uh, for all of the macro benchmarks, and we have to make sure that oh, this result is from this type of macro benchmark or this other type of macro benchmark. You know, like we we can have tons of different types, and all of the types is going to measure a specific a spe is going to benchmark a specific thing about Vitesse. And a uh, final big part of a macro benchmark is the aggregation and uh, the storing of metrics. So, you know, measuring the result of a macro benchmark is easily done using Sysbench, but it's usually not enough. Uh, we have to get more information. For example, the CPU usage um, of the host while we run the benchmark. This is very important for, like, we want to know in the 20 minutes that the benchmark ran, um, how much, like, how long the CPU was used for. This is important to compare across different versions. Um, like I said, we set up a Vitus cluster for the macro benchmarks, and the topology that we use for it is two VT gates, six uh, tablets, and the topology server that we have is etcd. Um, this is the configuration that we use so far, um, and we're aiming to change it. Uh, we want to make some tests um, discover which topology might or might not be the best for the benchmarks, um, which one is giving us more reliable and more accurate result. Um, Sysbench, so I talked about it. Uh, it like I said, widely known tool. Uh, it's also highly configurable. It's based in Lua um, and also in C, the C language. Uh, that means that you can add different workload, so different type of benchmarks, uh, using Lua files. Um, it has three steps. At least we used, the, we, we used three steps in, inside our FastJet, but there are a lot more in Sysbench. Those three steps that we use are the preparation, this step is basically going to create uh, the database, create the tables, insert the data into them, etc. The second step that we have is the warm-up. So this is going to do like an actual benchmark, but the results of it won't count. The goal is just to warm up the system, get, get the cache flowing, get um, the network flowing, everything ready and everything looking almost like an actual like an like an actual end-to-end -end situation. And final step is the execution. It's also called as the run step inside Sysbench. Um, so the execution is where we actually send a lot of queries to Vitesse and where we measure the performance. Um, we have two custom forks of Sysbench, uh, one of which is uh, the first link here, the plan scale slash, sys slash Sysbench. Uh, this fork includes a TPCH benchmark and it includes a different way of formatting the results. Uh, Sysbench usually format the results using text, just plain plain text, and uh, what we do instead is just um, display them using JSON. Um, and the second fork is just um, a bunch of Lua files for TPCC benchmark. Uh, TPCC and TPCH benchmarks are two big benchmarks using the database word. They're part of the TPC family. Um, if, if you know a bit databases and performance of databases, you might know them. Um, here is a sample of a Sysbench result. Uh, like we can, like we can see, it's pretty simple, pretty pretty straightforward. We just have the time that the benchmark ran. In that case, it's ten seconds. Uh, the number of threads that we used, um, the number of transactions per, per second, TPS, and then we have a block with uh, QPS query per seconds. So we have the total, the number of reads, the number of writes, and then other, which is for example begin, commit, um, etc. We also have the latency and the number of errors per second that we had, and uh, same thing for reconnects, the number of reconnections that we had. Um, but like we can see, it's not enough for us to tell if there is a regression between version A and version B of the test. It's, it's already good, a lot of data, but it's not enough. So we've added support for metrics. Um, so inside each, uh, inside each execution server, we start a Prometheus server, which will scrap, scrape data from the different components of the test and the host. Uh, different components being the VT gate, the VT tablets, 
um, VTCTLD, etc. So some of the interesting metrics that we that we want to look at are the CPU and memory uh, usage, um, also as the also the Golang metrics, uh, for example, go routines, etc. And finally, the disk I/O, the network. Um, those are all the different types of metrics that we that we want to keep, and that might be interesting if ever we want if ever if ever we see a regression. Um, so an important part of the metrics is obviously getting the metrics, uh, producing the metrics, and then we have to scrape them and store them. So to export the metrics from a benchmark server, we will like we use Prometheus so to, to gather all the metrics. This is inside the execution server. And then because the execution server is going to eventually get killed, like get get um, destroyed at the end of the benchmark, we want to make sure that the metrics we collected stays for a long time. So we can use them, we can uh, analyze them in the long run. And so for that, we use the metrics server, which is just we just create and store the metrics. Um, like I said before, metrics are going to be duplicated to an InfluxDB server for longevity. And uh, finally, metrics can be visualized um, on the web using Grafana. Um, so we have a couple of dashboards that allows us to say, show me, for example, I don't know, like the network usage for this benchmark at that time. I'm now going to move on to a demo uh, where I'm going to present um, the execution of a micro and micro and macro benchmark and um, and show you a bit about the Grafana UI and the metrics. All right, so here we can see a configuration file. Um, this is a YAML file, and we're going to use this file to feed the execution pipeline and configure the whole benchmark. So <clears throat> this benchmark here is an OLTP benchmark, so it is a macro benchmark. And as you can see, we have to define, for example, all the Equinix configurations, the token, the project that we want, and the instance type that we want to use. Then we have to feed, for example, the commit that we want to benchmark, the, the type, the type, like the, the name of the benchmark. And um, then we have the database uh, where we're going to store all the results, um, the different time series databases that we use. Uh, this one is Prometheus, this one is InfluxDB. Um, and then a little bit down, we have all the macro benchmark configuration. So all this part here is what we're going to give to Sysbench to configure it. So <clears throat> for example, here we want to have 50 tables with a certain size. We want to have, we want to use a hundred, a hundred threads, and then we configure the different steps of Sysbench. <clears throat> so like I said before, we have the prepare step, the warm up step, and then the run step, all of which are configured differently. For example, we have a different time. Here it's 30 seconds, 10 seconds, and then 900 seconds. And then, and then here we have an Ansible file that defines most of the variables and configuration that we want to configure the server that we create. So let's focus on this part here, which are all the host children. And if we look at here, we have VTGate. And here we're going to define all the different VTGates that we want, how many VTGates, the number, like the number of each port, and etc. <clears throat> so here we can see that we have six gateways, so six different VTGates. And here we have the same thing for the, the tablets. And we can see that we want to define two different VT tablets. All right, so now I'm going to use that configuration file to actually start a benchmark. Um, so I'm just going to use the command line here manually um, and feed, it, feed the, the configuration file that we have. Um, usually, all of this happens within the crones, and we don't have to start the benchmark manually using, using the CLI. But um, yeah, just for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to start it uh, manually. So I just type this command, then I press Enter, and then what happens here is that it's going to start creating the server. It's going to use Terraform. Um, to build and provision the infrastructure on Equinix Metal. And once this is ready, um, Ansible is going to start configure um, the benchmark itself. And as we can see now, um, Ansible is uh, configuring the host, so the server where we're going to run the benchmark. 
at the moment it's um, downloading all the dependencies um, to run Vitesse. <clears throat> uh, specifically, at the moment it's uh, downloading MySQL. Um, <clears throat> then it's going to build the actual Vitesse binaries and then it's going to create and start the Vitesse server with the topology that we saw in the Ansible file. And once this is done, it's going to start the actual benchmark using Sysbench. All right, as we can see here, the benchmark has finished. <clears throat> um, it lasted 50 minutes and now we'll be able to check out the results. So I'm logging into MySQL and then I'm going to run a specific query to get the result for my benchmark. Um, I can start by this query to get the latest um, execution, the latest benchmark. We can see the unique ID here, which is the one that we're gonna use to retrieve the different, <coughs> the different results. And um, here we can see the transaction per second, the latency, the number of errors, the time it took for the benchmark, the number of QPS, the number of uh, reads per second and writes. Um, <clears throat> so all of these results are displayed in the website that Manan showed you. And now I'm going to show you on Grafana what it looks like. So <clears throat> on Grafana we can visualize all the different metrics uh, that we collected during the benchmark. <clears throat> As we can see here, we have all the host metrics, so the CPU usage, memory, network, etc. Um, we can also take a look at <clears throat> the different queries, like the queries in MySQL or Vitesse related metrics. For example, QPS, um, the number of success, like the success rate, um, the time it takes for each um, queries. And we can also see like a more general overview of <clears throat> of the of the Vitesse cluster that we had for the benchmark. That's it for me. Um, thank you very much.